Alicia, the timing has to be perfect. I can't let my anxiety make me make a last minute mistake. It took me almost six months to get it right. I can't screw it up now. I'm Alicia Walker. I just turned 45 and I'm about to make a drastic lifestyle change. I've been married to Bill Walker for a little over 20 years. We dated and then were engaged for another five years. We have one daughter who is in college. This Friday night, it's the 25th anniversary of our first date. He is sentimental about these things. Bill has arranged a special dinner for us at our favorite restaurant. Unfortunately, he's going to get the biggest and worst surprise of his life. Even now, I love the big guy. The first few years of our marriage were perfect. I had no doubt that we would spend the rest of our lives together. Oh, we had to work hard and share responsibilities, especially after our daughter Elizabeth was born. Bill made me quit my job until she was old enough to go to school. When I went back to work, our main goals were to pay for college for Elizabeth and save for retirement. Our bank accounts skyrocketed thanks to increased income from promotions and pay raises, Bill's wise investments, and an inheritance from our deceased parents. I fully supported Bill during this time. Although we sometimes disagreed, we never quarreled. We made love regularly and had sex several times when one or both of us were particularly aroused. I never, ever thought about cheating on him, although I was regularly hit on by men at the office and even at neighborhood get-togethers. It wasn't what I wanted. I was fine with Bill. Now I have to admit that I'm a hypocrite. I publicly condemned cheaters, but I loved hearing the details of their affairs. I'd heard of women suffering from empty nest syndrome. The women supposedly go emotionally insane and become whores or nuns. The personality supposedly changes overnight. Personally, I thought that was nonsense. I thought not having children at home was a chance to strengthen my marriage with Bill. Elizabeth was mostly on her own before she went to college. She rarely came home before bedtime. We had pretty much gotten used to her being on her own. I saw no reason to prepare to make any changes in my life. Perhaps I should have. With more time to think about myself, I had time to consider whether men found me still attractive. Finally, I decided to do something I hadn't done in a long time. I looked in the full-length mirror without clothes on. Where my skin used to be smooth, I had wrinkles. What used to stand out on its own was now sagging. What used to be flat had gained a muffin top. What used to be wide now deserved a wide plaque. I began to pay attention to men's compliments and double entendres. Either I wasn't paying attention or the interest of men other than my husband diminished. I started working out more, wearing more makeup and dressing to emphasize my best features, my breasts. Men's admiration increased. I felt better about myself, and yet I felt I needed something else, something different, something exciting, something playful and risky. I started reading stories about cheating and watching movies online. When I analyzed what was happening at home, I saw no difference in the way my husband treated me compared to the way he had treated me before Elizabeth left. That was the problem. Everything was the same as it had always been. Oh, I got compliments from him. He never missed a birthday or anniversary. We still had sex regularly, but it was the same old compliments and the same old sex. Pleasant, but it felt like a rerun, not the original episodes. I wanted a change, a boost of energy. I thought I was giving Bill a chance to give me a change. I tried to get Bill interested in different sex positions or different techniques to liven things up. The poor guy tried, but there was no excitement for me. The sex acts were different and everything was fine, but it was the same old Bill. It was then that I first thought about finding someone who could give me a thrill, maybe even become my lover. My priority in finding a new partner was first and foremost secrecy. If I got caught, it would kill me because it would ruin my husband and daughter. That meant no fake late nights at work or business trips with sleepovers. Hotels or sleepovers at his or my place were considered too dangerous for me. I began to think it would have to be a workplace affair during work hours but even that would require careful planning. Looking through my options from the office, I ruled out almost all the men. There were a couple of good-looking single men, but I'd heard them brag about the sluts they'd dated, including some married women. I couldn't have them bragging about me. Each day at home became more and more burdensome. Our routine had come to a standstill. Something had to change or I would go crazy. 
Even the new sex toys provided little more than a brief respite from the boredom. Then it happened, or rather he did. His name was Darnell, short for Darn. Some of the other men would say, damn, and then laughingly apologize for getting his name mixed up. About six months ago, he took a mid-level position in the office. All the women took notice of his looks and charm. I was afraid a few women would try to rape him. They did it with their eyes, of course. Although he flirted a bit, he never seemed to seek any relationship beyond friendship and professional relationships. I noticed that he would hold his gaze and smile for a few seconds when he looked at me. My heart fluttered. Every few days he would stop by for small talk and ask me something about my husband or daughter, very discreetly and without alarming anyone but my lust buds. The first change in our relationship came when he asked to sit with me at lunch. I knew this could be the first step toward what I thought I wanted, so I agreed. He immediately said, I hope this doesn't mean that the office gossip machine will now consider us a couple. I laughed and explained, I'll take my chances. I could use a little excitement in my life right now. I don't think I wanted to, at least consciously let him know that there was something missing in my life. But it spilled out. It's too late to take it all back, even if I wanted to. Our contact continued to be brief and casual. I learned that his wife, Mary Alice, was from a wealthy background and they had no children. He spoke well of her, but not lovingly. Her family didn't want her to marry him. If they fought, she liked to use in her arguments the fact that she had married him against her family's wishes so he should be grateful. I told him about my daughter and how proud I was of her. I described the relationship with my husband as comfortable, predictable, and unchanging. Gradually, I let him know that I was not satisfied with my home life. Eventually, I hinted at the lack of pleasurable sex with my husband. I didn't tell Darnell that I needed another man for sex. He guessed on his own what I needed. Darnell made it clear to me that he wanted us to be more than just friendly co-workers. I timidly admitted that I felt the same way, knowing full well the path I was embarking on. We took precautions. We tried not to look longingly at each other. No touching and no overt flirting. We assumed that everyone thought we were friends who were happily married to other people. As a smokescreen, I even teased Ted, another man in our office, about being my office husband and told him he had to up his game to stay married to me. The distraction seemed to work. The situation finally escalated the day we happened to be alone in the elevator. Darn pressed the stop button. I guessed correctly why. He brazenly pounced on me with a passionate kiss, which I eagerly responded to. Our hands quickly explored all over each other's bodies. In the minutes that followed, everything was forgotten except enjoying each other. I didn't want to pull away when he released the button and the elevator touched. All he said was, we need to talk. I nodded my head. That day, I didn't have time to do anything but think about the time we spent in the elevator. There was a slight feeling of guilt, but the I want more feeling overrode my guilt. Darn called me and offered to tell my husband that I would have to stay a few minutes late today. I wondered if he wanted to go further in our sexual explorations this evening. I hoped he did. He walked into my office and immediately stated that we needed to hurry up and that staying late was not customary. On his part, there was no attempt to approach me. Instead, we talked. We agreed that we both wanted to be intimate with each other, but had to be extremely careful about it. We both went home and started thinking of a safe way to do what we wanted to do. I read that women who cheat often tell their spouses that the marriage is intact because her husband still has sex with her whenever he wants. They didn't realize they were cheating on their husband outside the bedroom as well. I immediately started treating Bill differently without realizing it myself. I guess I wanted to find faults in him so I wouldn't feel guilty when I was with my lover. After the elevator episode, I was almost constantly, mentally, with my potential lover. Things that Bill did at home that were minor irritants that I hadn't paid attention to before were now an issue. When I brought up issues, I brought them up loudly. Things that I used to ask him to do and knew he would eventually do now elicited my nagging if they weren't done quickly. I was becoming a bitch. Meanwhile, Darnell had come up with a solution for our meetings. He rented a small spare room on the floor above us in an office building. I asked how he could afford it. He replied, it's the perk of being a rich wife. I didn't complain. 
We got some basic furniture, among which, most importantly, was a large sofa with an easily washable cover. We christened it as soon as we could. Sex with Darnell turned out even better than expected. We were euphoric, and we both uttered the L word. I'm pretty sure we actually meant lust and not love. From then on, when we had breaks to get together, we would leave the table at different times. One was taking the stairs, and the other was riding the elevator. We were never together when going to or coming back from our love nest. Our days and times for sex were random and varied. From time to time, we took a few days off to reduce the likelihood of being caught. We tried to think of all the ways our spouses could catch us. We constantly checked for cameras or recording devices in the office and at home. We never emailed or texted each other. Darnell bought us special phones that we only used to talk to each other. If our spouses saw the phone, we had to tell them it was a work phone only. We chose passwords unrelated to our families that would be easy to guess. We thought of seemingly everything. As my relationship with Darnell grew, so did my desire to be with him all the time. I still loved Bill, but he no longer evoked the feelings in me that Darnell did. Bill was an old pair of comfortable slippers that I didn't want to throw away. Darnell was a new pair of overpriced shoes that I just had to have. Darn was the first to talk about the fact that we could be together forever. Together, we hatched a definite plan. We casually told our spouses that an acquaintance of ours had a spouse who died suddenly. Although there was a will, the accounts in the deceased spouse's name were frozen, so the surviving spouse could not immediately access them. The litigation took over six months, and the surviving spouse had to borrow money until the probate issue was resolved. We said that this could have been avoided if their bank accounts had been set up in both their names. Mary Alice agreed to finally prove to Darnell that she, unlike her family, believed he was not a gold digger. In our case, Bill took the hint, and we both added each other's names to our existing accounts. He was the one who suggested that the safe that held old jewelry, gold coins, and savings bonds should also be in both of our names. I thanked him with one of the best nights of sex I'd had in a while. It may have been Bill's body, but in my mind, it was Darnell's. I hadn't realized how differently I felt about Bill until Elizabeth arrived. Both Bill and I were happy to see her. The three of us laughed and told stories from her childhood. It was like traveling back in time. She took me aside and said that my father had informed her that I had been moody lately and he was asking what was wrong. Liz mentioned that I seemed normal to her during this meeting. I said that her father was probably right about something. I acknowledged that I was in a bad mood and suggested that I might be going through menopause. I assured her that our marriage was stronger than ever. It pained me to lie to my daughter, but I couldn't yet tell her the truth. When Darnell and I had a chance to talk afterward, I told him that I thought Bill was beginning to worry about me. I said that I thought we should make plans to be together sooner than we had talked about it before. What we came up with was very unfair to Bill and Mary Alice, but we were already cheating, so what the hell? We were going to take all the money we could and disappear together. For them, it wouldn't be so cruel. Both of our spouses had access to a lot of money, Bill because of his job and Mary Alice because of her family. Neither of them would suffer financially for too long. Darnell didn't like Mary Alice's family, so he didn't mind getting the family money. I made some unworthy excuse to myself to justify robbing my husband as blind. I tried to get him to change, but nothing worked. I didn't want to think about it. I focused on getting away with my lover and doing whatever we wanted, when we wanted, and where we wanted. No more traveling down memory lane. It was almost time. I called the restaurant and verified that Bill had indeed made a reservation for 6 p.m. He had, and a bottle of our favorite wine was already chilling. Bill said he would have to stay a little late at work and he would meet me there. At 3.30 p.m., I was at our bank. I gave the girl my ID and told her I wanted to withdraw all of our money from our joint accounts. When she looked at our accounts, she had a puzzled look on her face. I think you and your husband may have gotten mixed up. He was in earlier today and has already withdrawn almost all of the money. When so much money is withdrawn, we are encouraged to ask why, in case it has something to do with customer service. According to the note in the computer, he said he was afraid of the stock market crash and wanted to, for a while, pay in cash. 
Whoever did the transaction tried to assure him the money was safe, but your husband insisted. What about the safety deposit box? Maybe he put cash in it, but I don't work in that department. See the man in the brown jacket by the elevator? He can help you there. Do you have the key to the safe deposit box with you? I do. I approached the man and was asked to sign the register. While I was doing that, I noticed Bill's signature a few names ahead of mine. Either he had put the money in the box or he had gotten ahead of me to clear it. Big difference. Huge. I went downstairs and we opened the door to the safe deposit box. I was anxiously awaiting what I would find. I was very nervous. Our box was placed on a table and I was left alone to open it. My heart dropped. There was nothing in it, except a letter. Alicia, if you're reading this, you know I beat you to our money. Darnell must find out now, too, the same thing. When Mary Alice and I found out what you and Darnell were up to, we started thinking about what to do. Although we thought about divorce, we realized that your plan was better. Hide with the money and disappear. You two were very good at hiding your affair. If you want to blame someone for us finding out about it, blame the telemarketer who called you on your second cell phone while you were in the other room. Apparently, you turned off the sound, but not the vibrating ringer. When I pulled this scam phone out of your purse, I saw that you had a telemarketer calling you. For a while, I didn't think anything of it. But then I just wondered, why would you need a second phone? There could be several good reasons, but I immediately thought of one terrible reason, to cover up an affair. I considered this reason as justification for your recent behavior, but I didn't hint to you that I was beginning to have doubts, despite other signs of cheating. Remember when I bought that box of helium pens because I kept losing pens? I gave you a few and scattered many around the house so I could find them when I needed a pen. Anyway, each pen had a transmitter in it that sent all the conversations to my computer. I made sure you always had one pen in your purse. It took us a few days to get the whole story, but we did. While planning together, we were trying to help each other heal a broken heart, and we fell in love. At first, it was revenge sex, but then it grew into something more. The idea of going away to romantic places with an exciting new lover was stolen from the two of you, but it suited us just fine, especially since you both thought it was good enough for you. I've sent Liz my side of the story, so in a couple days, she'll know what's going on. I assured her that I would make sure that the rest of her tuition would be paid for. She will probably want to talk to you once she gets the information. I've told her about you and Darnell, so be prepared. As Mary Alice and I travel the world together, we'll keep an eye on you guys. I'm not sure you'll find the money to start traveling, especially since your boss has been notified about you dating during work hours. We'll send postcards if you can't make it. By the way, Mary Alice and I recently canceled your airline ticket. I don't think you'll want to leave the country without cash or credit cards. One of the things I told Mary Alice but didn't tell you is that I had a nickname I got in elementary school. I was called Toad after I played the part of a frog in the school play. This fact got me thinking about another way of breaking up with a loved one not mentioned in Simon and Garfunkel's song. My version of what we do is, take it on the road, Toad. I'm sure it's not funny to you or Darnell. That's too bad. We like it. I guess I should thank you for almost 20 years of marriage and a wonderful daughter. Somehow hearing what you actually think of me as a husband and lover and what you plan to do to me makes it hard for me to play nice. Anyway, I hope the sex with Darnell was worth it. At least you still got that. Goodbye, Bill and Mary Alice.